fun story of me being sat on Michael Schumacher's teammate's lap. But with my dad, we can't find the picture and we can't remember who was the teammate. So we've got this thing of it's either Jos Verstappen or it's Martin Brundle. The less you know about a topic, the more you think you understand it to its depth. And the more you dive into a topic, the more you realize, oh, I know nothing. And I love being in that spot. The FIA doesn't have a great reputation of being consistent in their decision making. And I think this is just added to that. F1, I believe, is trying to be extremely cautious here. Of if we add an 11th team to the grid, it has to work. Beating heart and soul of Formula One is in Europe. Like being a woman in male dominated spaces where I've you know, gone into meetings where it is my meeting and I've invited people and I'm leading it and people ask, give me their coffee orders when they walk into the room. Hello, good evening, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Georgie Stripping the Dipping Podcast. I'm your unusual co-host, longtime F1 sufferer, F1 Blag, and tonight I've got a fantastic guest. This guest tonight, as I do the intro, is the host of not one but two podcasts. She's also the founder of a media company, not another media company to give it to the right <laughs> total, and also the co-founder, or founder, should I say, of Sunday Fangirls. Without further ado, uh, Tony Cohen-Brown, how are you doing? How's it going? That's an amazing introduction. I might just have to steal that and run with it. Um, I'm I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for asking, and I'm I'm delighted for us to finally have this conversation. Brilliant. Well, look. Um, before we get into it, we always ask yeah. this question uh, to the people on uh, to you about the people that are listening. How would you introduce yourself? Who's Tony? How do you how do you uh, say who you are? Oh, I love this question. I did a podcast the other day and I, I swear I think my answer took 30 minutes and they're like, mm -hmm, that's great. So I promise I won't <laughs> do that to you. Um, I, I've had multiple lives. I started my career in politics. I then went into tech and now I somehow landed in most sports. But the common thread for all of this is I love complex issues, breaking them down. And I feel like the less you seem to understand something, the more there is worth digging. So at heart, I think I'm a storyteller who loves pulling apart complex um, complex topics and trying to explain them in the most succinct and complete way possible. And I'm very curious. So I guess that curiosity plus that desire for good storytelling is, is who I am at my core. And that was an interesting journey for me as I left the tech space and realized, who am I when you take away the name of the company you work for or the big executive title or the logo or the brand, like who is that person? So that's the journey that I've been on. So that would be my answer these days. Gosh, uh, don't make me take away the, the job title or the employer. I don't really want to ask those questions uh, and have a it's, midlife crisis. <laughs> it, well, that's, I think that's why I went through. That's exactly it. I've definitely had that moment of, wow, why should, it's a great question when you ask yourself, why should anyone be excited be, by being sat at a dinner, you know, next to you? And you can't introduce yourself as the exec at Google or, you know, head of expansion at this great cool tech company or I run politics like who am I who are you? it's a great it's it's worth doing but it's a very weird process to go through so when you're ready I definitely invite you to do it but but yeah it's, it's not an easy journey <laughs> yeah so we're recording this I've had a long hard day at work it's been a horribly sort of overcast few days I've got a cup of tea it might not be the moment for me today is um... not the day today is not the day <laughs> No, and, but setting the scene, so I've given you the dour surroundings that I'm in. Where, where are you uh, speaking from today? I'm based in California, and I would normally say bright, sunny California, but we are experiencing weather like I think California has never experienced. I think it's something like we've had more water in the past week than they've experienced in the last 60 years combined, which is kind of insane. Um, so, yeah, I'm coming Whoa. to you from San Francisco, California, currently um, flooded landslides, doom and gloom, um, earthquakes, you name it. We're having it right now. OK, I'm, I'm sure The Rock's there thinking about his next <laughs> movie. Um, <laughs> perhaps. Not, not to sort of... Uh, Poor score and over. Capitalize on a, on a terrible moment. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. Turn, you, there's there's going to be some stories written about this moment, I think. I think also Californians, you have to understand that the houses are not built for this weather. No one's got, owns a coat or an umbrella. You know, I, when I used to live in the UK, wellies, umbrellas, hats, scarves were a thing that you always mm. have. This isn't the case here. So I think everyone's very confused by what's happening. No, indeed. Uh, I've lived in a few places where a light drizzle will sort of cancel proceedings. Um, 
but it sounds like <laughs> there's a little it. more going on yeah exactly there's a little more than a drizzle but yes that's 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 the spirit right now indeed well we're we're a bit of a motorsport podcast i say a bit of because what we're really fascinated about is the people in and around motorsport, not necessarily just the drivers, okay. um, but also the people um, that talk about it, that care about it, that are uh, that part of the scene. You talked about going from politics to tech to F1. Mm. Um, how did you, what, you've written a guide on F1, but like, how did you sort of become a beginner on F1? What was your first memory? So my first memory, so I was born in France. I grew up in Belgium and I was brought up by a single dad for a good chunk of my life. Um, and Belgium, Brussels, I, where I lived for 20 years, is an hour away from spa Francorchamps, which is obviously an iconic track in, on the Formula One calendar. And my, we weren't a big sports household. And my dad didn't watch football, cricket, you name it. But he did watch Formula One. So my early memories are definitely peering over my dad's shoulder as he's watching Formula One at home and then being dragged to Formula One races. There's some fun stories of me losing baby teeth at Formula One races and people being like, is she okay? Is she sleeping on the front row of an F1 race? We're confused by what's happening with this child right now. Um, there's a fun story of me being sat on Michael Schumacher's teammates lap but with my dad we can't find the picture and we can't remember who was the teammate so we've got this thing of it's either Jos Verstappen or it's Martin Brundle and I kind of really want to know whose lap I was sat on on the age of six seven years old um so I've got these early fond memories of those of of those days of just being dragged around um in the kindest way possible obviously as a child to these things and not quite understanding what was happening and then I went back again as a student job to Spa Francorchamps for a couple of years, selling, you know, the merchandise and doing the whole camping. I will never do that again. It was great when you're a, a student, um, but there is no way I'm sleeping on grass for four days and four nights straight ever again. Uh, I think I broke my back. But that's the fun time of being, you know, an 18 year old student. Um, so did that for a few years. And then I in and out with the sport. It's, it's a hard sport, I think, to to remain a fan nonstop. I actually know very few people who followed Formula One without a blip, without a dip. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I noticed that a handful of my friends were getting into Formula One and I was confused as to why. And then I discovered it's because Drive to Survive had got them excited. And also it was just like this perfect storm that happened in the sense, again, you know, silver lining here, but um, the pandemic hit, everyone was stuck at home, no one was experiencing, you know, football or sp any sporting events, esports was blowing up, TikTok was just discovered and blowing up. And so all of this together meant that I was seeing Formula One pop up left, right and centre. And I had this moment of, oh, I can actually talk about this with people around me. And actually, this can be a topic of conversation versus just the thing that was either a memory from my youth or just something that I would consume on my own. And friends started texting me, asking me questions. And one thing led to another. And I, famously, one of my friends was explained to me the dynamic between Red Bull and Alpha Tari. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I'm really confused. Is it the same as Alfa Romeo and Ferrari? And so I tried to explain to it and realized that there's so many layers. And then he, that person said, and you know, little did we know at the time, but you know, when all of this is over, and this is what was at the start of the pandemic, but when all of this is over and we go back to racing, what do I need to know to watch the races properly? It gave me the 10 bullets and those 10 bullets turned into a 54 page beginner's guide, which st cut story very short. That first guide was published in my newsletter. Then I did it, turned it into a PDF. Then it landed on someone's desk inside a Formula One marketing team that turned into a partnership with Formula One to do the official beginner's guide with Formula One, which was a little booklet. And then last year, I turned it into a big digital website format so that more people could consume it. But that's essentially what it was. It started with friends being curious and wanting to know more and me not being able to be succinct because you can imagine my friend was like, I asked for bullet points and you gave me 54 pages. I'm not reading this. What is this? Um, which then led to the TikTok because I thought, how can I teach myself to be succinct and concise? Indeed. And um, 54 pages suggests you had a lot of energy going on during uh, the first lockdown or something. <laughs> yes, but you actually like followed many through. people. Like, yes. We were all going to learn a language and write a book. And you actually wrote a guidebook that got picked up by F1. So. Oh, I like that. I, yeah. I will run with that. I really like that. Yes, I'm... I. There's so much more to that. But yes, I was. I need to be kept busy. And at that time... There were v we, just, we were Europeans moving to America, visa situations. We got stuck in Canada. And I was like, I need to keep busy. And so I think this friend who 
unknowingly just asked me a question unlocked this moment of right let's sit down and do something productive here and hopefully useful and i love the i love the guide um we have thank you um, so much a, no problem we have a guide a variety of people on the podcast and while no one will come out and say it, those that have known Formula One for a while, you know, we tend, we can be a bit gatekeepy, but you, you've kind of been the opposite. You know, at, at the least we might look down on a Drive to Survive fan, but actually you were enabling them and, and helping them get into the sport. Um, do you have any favorite hot topics or bits <sighs> that you're most proud of? <laughs> oh, that's such a brilliant question. Um... I also like that I'm a DTS fan enabler. I think I need to slap that on a T-shirt. It's brilliant. I'm just stuck with that. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, I think one of my favorite moments was that realization, the Dunning-Kruger effect is happening to me right now again with Formula E and the Dunning-Kruger effect. It really is this sentiment that you think you understand the topic and actually you realize you know 1% of the topic. And it generally happens to people that you think you understand the less you know about a topic the more you think you understand it to its depth and the more you dive into a topic the more you realize oh I know nothing and I love being in that spot and what I started to realize is some of the most interesting questions that were allowing me to put out really cool content were coming from newer fans who had what's people might call naive questions, but were absolutely not naive questions. And I think one of my favorite moments is this person asking me, hey, this might be a stupid question, but where did the drivers put the key once the car started? And I had this moment of my knee jerk reaction was obviously, well, there isn't a key, obviously, but my mean reaction could have been, you stupid, there's no key in Formula One, what are you talking about? But instead I went, wait, hold on a minute, there isn't a key, but let's talk about why there isn't a key, which leads you to how do you actually start a Formula One car, which leads you to, you actually need 20 people to start a Formula One car, which means that a key would actually be completely pointless at this time. And so that led me to all of like, just, just unraveling of level, let's talk about this. And I think that was my, that, that moment and that realization of, oh, this is going to be fun because there are endless questions about Formula One. And again, I think the format on TikTok was worked really nicely for me is every time I put out a video, someone else had another question and someone else was putting on the thread. And so it became this collective exercise of let's answer all of the questions. And truly there are no dumb questions. Um, and I like, I ended up in this place at marveling at how little I actually knew about a sport that I'd been following for so long. And, and I think I've, I've, been conscious enough and I've been proactive enough that now no one comes on my page and says well everyone knows this because they know that they'll be booed out of there as fast as they finish that sentence because I only discovered what was it? I only discovered the other day that you know being a pit stop member isn't actually a job the guys who run the pit stops are also full-time you know mechanics or they're full-time engineers or they're full-time it, it was fascinating to me because of course it makes sense but I never actually thought about it that you're never just a pit stop man or a pit stop woman. That's not a job. Your pit stop is on top of something else. Which so anyway, that I think those are two examples for me of just like how excited I got about this space and 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 then the diversity because people were coming at it through fundamentally different lenses. And I thought that was cool. People were looking at the sport through their cultural background, through their lens, through their understanding. And, and it's just led to just epic conversations. So I would say to answer your question in the least succinct way, it is all of that tech and all of those layers in Formula One and this concept that we have right now, which is Formula One at the intersection of pop culture, internet culture, technology, politics, and you just can't have motorsports in its own siloed context. Like it just doesn't work. It's it's interacting with all of these elements, which I find pretty cool. It's cool. It's fascinating. Sometimes it can be incredibly frustrating. Uh, incredibly. But... <laughs> Look, why, why don't we um, pour through some of the big sort of F1 topics of the week or the yeah, F1 Twitter let's do topics it. of the week. And maybe actually what, what you were saying there about the different lenses people look at the sport through, they, that, that's often colours how people, you know, how they form their opinions on these things. So maybe that will come out as we go through. Yeah. And do you, out of curiosity, do you yeah. consume your, where do you consume most of your F1 content? Like where do you pull from? Ooh, it's a really good question. So honestly, uh, up until, this sounds like a very, uh, I don't know, what's the opposite of impartial, partial view, biased yeah. view. Probably since the end of 2021, I turned the race on, with, or I turned qualifying on at the start of Q1, and I turn it off, you know, yeah. with, with, and then similarly, and on Sky, and similarly, I do the same for the race. But then the rest of it is, yeah, largely online, 
Um, and yeah, I wouldn't say like sometimes I look at the race. I think that's quite an interesting uh, group of them, pundits. Yeah, yeah they, they yeah. know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. And deeply, really. and deeply opinionated, which I think yeah. is what I like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But beyond that, yeah. I mean, I'm probably not a huge consumer of media. And in terms of being like, yeah. I'm not a good person for the marketers out there because I'm quite frugal. I, I probably owned about two pieces of F1 merch in 20 years. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and to your point, like you tune in when you need to, you tune out when you need to, and then you you have a look. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What, but what about you? Like, are you, you're in California, so I presume you're on ESPN, but are you getting sort of additional media? What are you looking at? For, for so I'm definitely never been a TV. It's a very weird one because I was, Ooh. when I was a kid, I was never really allowed to watch the TV. So TV's just not been a staple in my life. And then as I grew up, then we had, you know, CDIs, interactive CD-ROMs and all of that stuff, which was a little bit, but then most of, for me, TV is, you know, a giant box and everything goes through Apple, Amazon, Hulu, you name it. Uh, so I and ESPN, I just came out of doing actually um, uh, a program with ESPN for content creators, which has been spectacular. But I also feel like I've learned so much about ESPN because I didn't grow up with ESPN because I grew up in Europe. So obviously knew of ESPN, but it wasn't a brand that I would associate with, um, which has been a fascinating journey. But I still listen to Crofty and Brundle, um, f but through F1 TV. So all of my consumption is through F1 TV, which is funny, actually, when I ended up in London mid of net last year and I realized, oh, I can't have... I can't see the races on F1 TV in the UK. Like there is no backlog. It was just such an interesting moment. I was like, oh, I have to watch it live whilst it's happening on the TV. So that was an interesting moment for me. But since doing all of this content, I'm consuming it everywhere. I'm on the Reddit for forums. I'm on Twitter. I try and interestingly not consume it on TikTok because that clouds the content that I want to make. And that's an interesting one. When you start making content in a, in a certain area, your, your relationship to the, how you consume it, what you consume and how you create it is shifts. So I try not follow too many people on on TikTok, um, but yeah, it's it's mostly I go to the BBC Guardian, the race. I like doing a mix of going to motorsport pundits and opinionated motorsport pundits, and just general news. I like seeing what the Forbes writes, you know, Forbes or the New York Times writes about um, Formula One because you, it gives you an interesting it gives you an interesting comparison. And then Twitter is its own beast, and so is Reddit. Um, but yeah, I I don't I don't. There's not many places where I don't consume Formula One content. Is what I'm getting from my answer to you. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, I mean, to write the beginner's guide and keep it up to date, you've got to be on the on the pulse of uh, of all Formula One content. You and do. it does sound like you are. Yeah. <laughs> It gets exhausting, which is why people are like, why wouldn't you get into IndyCar and MotoGP? And I'm like, do you know how much of my time is spent on Formula One? I don't have enough hours in a day because that's how I work. I'm very broad and in-depth. So I like, it's not enough for me to just get an answer or a number. Like I want to know how and how we got here and why it hasn't changed or why it has changed and who was part, like I need to do it. So I'm slowly starting to get into Formula E, but let's be real, I can't add any more sports to this because of the the broadness and the depth in which I go and everyone's very different obviously but I always laugh when people are like wow, well, why don't you do Indy and NASCAR I do not have enough hours in a day for that <laughs> it sounds like when you're in you're in in as people exactly might not say. yes yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly that's a nice way of putting it so um you talked about sort of the lens we watch it through the politics the pop culture the first thing I, I'd like to bring up with you because yeah. I, I see that you're at the intersection of all those things is I think it was just before Christmas, uh, the FIA sort of snuck out a bit of a, a mm. proclamation that teams and drivers would have to get pre-authorization to essentially make political statements yeah. in and around the weekends. Um, where do you think that's come from? And do you think it's enforceable? Oh, short answer, no. Absolutely not enforceable. There's no way in hell. And it's funny to me. And I lo I was cackling at this because I was like, if your goal with this is to keep this conversation off the table so we pretend that politics isn't a thing, this has just put it right in the middle of the table. This is now our, you know, this is now our start, our main course and our dessert because it was so vague. The two pieces or that in additional paragraph that they added is so incredibly vague and broad purposefully I'll add and I'll come to that in a second but was so broad and vague that people are going to have so many questions of how it's enforced when it is enforced why it was decision taken a decision in one way and not the other way and the FIA doesn't have a great reputation of being consistent in their decision making and I think this is just added to that so 
yeah, short answer to your question, there's no way that this is going to be easily enforceable. The reason for me why it's so broad and so vague and it comes back to this, this desire of relevancy and power. And look, the FIA, I, I don't blame them, but the FIAs must definitely be having a moment of identity crisis right now of who are they and why are they relevant and why are they useful? And they were definitely useful when they started back in the day and it's very clear why they were started and it was about putting you know driver sent driver safety and security at the center but again i don't think that's anything that anyone has to worry about these days which is a great evolution of the sport of course but i think there's definitely and i am prone to always forgetting that formula one and the fia aren't the same body they're very fundamentally different people yes they should be collaborating together yes they should be on the same page but the reality is they're often not and the bbc wrote a brilliant post on this that clearly this is highlighting that there is some struggles and there is some tension between the FIA and Formula One. But from the get-go, and since Mohamed Ben Salim sorry, took his job, it has been clear that this has been about him making him and FIA and the FIA more relevant, but also it's about power and influence. And to your point, I I, I couldn't help but laugh when the Andretti also very relevant to what's been happening recently, but when the Andretti Cadillac news came out and Mohammed bin Salim on his own personal account started tweeting around, you know, I'm disappointed at the adverse reaction and I'm disappointed teams are more excited. And no one said anything publicly anyway. So I'm just like, if there's been issues privately, surely you should keep that private. But no one's publicly, and I've been asked, I've asked a couple of journalists and I've been looking around, but no one since I think like April or May of last year has come out and had an adverse reaction to the Andretti news publicly anyway. And so I was looking at you. And so as you read between the lines, you're like, oh, this is the FIA being annoyed that Formula One isn't more excited about Andretti um, and Cadillac coming to the grid. And we can have a whole separate conversation about that. But the fact that he was tweeting about this on his personal account and being very personal, my mind just went to wait, oh, hold on a minute. So a couple of months, the FIA came out and said drivers can no longer voice their opinions without prior written consent. And to be clear, this was, it was very, the one thing that was clear, it wasn't just political or religious, but it was also personal opinions. And then the FIA president coming out with lots of opinions and tweeting them very personally on his personal account. Meanwhile, the FIA official account is staying very quiet and it's business as usual. And I was just wrapping my head around it. It's as if people have personal opinions and opinions of their own that don't reflect their employee and that's and their employer. And that's actually a good thing. And so I'm just like, it's all at odds. It makes no sense. Um, like it truly makes no sense to me. And yeah. I think it's going <laughs> to. You're assuming things are designed to make sense, I guess, or <laughs> there's a there's a method to the madness. I don't there's know. There's a method to the madness. And I think that's the question that everyone has is why now? And when you think why now, it's why now at a macro level is the FIA needs to establish itself as an organization that is needed, as an organization that is part of this, you know, trio of it's not even it's bigger than a trio, but Formula One, the teams, the drivers, the promoters. And also it's coming at a time where a lot of new countries are throwing a lot of money into Formula One. Um, a lot of authoritarian regimes are throwing a lot of money into Formula One. And these promoters with the amount of money that they're putting on the table are going to have requests. And I can only imagine that some of those requests, if we look at what happened at the Qatar World Cup, are going to be no political statements. And then you can have a whole conversation about what's actually political because that what, truly what hurt me was seeing the couple of days ago, Mohammed bin Salayam saying, you know, we can't have these drivers pushing their personal agenda. I don't believe that Sebastian Vettel talking about climate change is a personal agenda. I don't believe that Lewis Hamilton talking about racism in America and diversity and equality is a personal agenda. I, I just, it, and at any rate, the more questions you have, the more you realize it's such a broad, complex topic, which is why I don't envy the FIA having put out something as, you know, as broad and as vague as what they have done. They're going to have questions. Uh, the way I look at it, and I'm not a big believer in astrology, although, you know, each to his or her <laughs> own. But I, I kind of see all that, you know, they talk about the, diff the different like, geographical pools of the planets and, yes. and the stars. Like, I feel like the FIA is a huge planet. You've got uh, Liberty Media or Formula One, whatever you want to call yeah. it. And then I think you've got the teams as well. And, and if we kind of segue nicely onto the Andretti story that you alluded to, yeah. clearly, you know, there's a finite amount of revenue or at least people's view is that the pie is a certain size. They're trying to grow it in the US, fine. Um, yeah. But then if you're one of the teams, particularly if you're in the midfield or towards the back, um, you know, you want your percentage of that of that revenue, yeah. that TV broadcasting rights and, and so on. And so seeing another 
you know, at, at 11th party come up to the table and ask, you know, with their spoon and bowl in hand, you are going to be resistant of that. And, and the mm. point you make about sort of the FIA being necessary, I guess the question is, if the FIA wants Andretti uh, and Cadillac in the sport, um, even if Liberty Media want them in the sport to grow in the US, if the teams don't want it, you know, what power do the mm. FIA or indeed Liberty have to, to put put the uh, to put Liberty sorry to put Andretti in there do yeah. you see how do you see things moving forward with all those power bases so disparate and I it's I love this these questions because and I definitely come at it without the expert knowledge of you know working inside of, of any of these uh, of these stakeholders but from my understanding is the teams essentially have little say let's be very clear they can definitely voice their contempt um, I think where it's going to become interesting is where the teams say hey we know there's this you know official initial sum of money which is 200 million that any new team has to put on the table the reality is that should be closer to 600,000 800,000 um oh, sorry 800 million or 600 million i.e we're talking teams should come with a billion essentially and i don't think that's wrong i think that's interesting i can see the team's worry um from this especially as you know they've put so much time and effort into it and actually my where my head was going was wait when was the last time we had 11 teams on the grid and it was actually only, only or 2016 depends on how you look which felt like both a long time ago but not that long time ago and if you look at a success metrics of what was the latest team or additional team to the grid that's actually been somewhat successful that's Haas and we know that it hasn't been easy for Haas so I think what's interesting for me is F1 I believe is trying to be extremely cautious here of if we add an 11th team to the grid it has to work. We can't have a team dip in and then dip out because of lack of funds or it's become a little bit too complicated. Like it's not that easy. And so I think the way I'm looking at it is the teams are flagging, hey, hold up a minute. It's actually not just as easy as we've got, a, we've got some funds, we've got a manufacturer, we've got a household name brand and off to the races, off we go. Because I think these teams know that this is, you know, for some of them, it's 70 years in the making to get to where they are today. And I think it would look bad on the sport if we had all of a sudden a team come in and then drop off two or three years later, especially right now at this point in time. But the flip side of that is Andretti comes with a huge fan base in America, comes with huge name recognition, whether it's Andretti or Cadillac or Moto um, um, MG, sorry. And um, and truly, I think if, if that duo, and let's be real, Andretti's been talking about this for a while, but he finally pivoted and came to the table and said, okay, it's not just the Andretti name, I'm adding the Cadillac name to this. So he definitely listened. They definitely listened and came back to, uh, came back to the table with a much better deal than they initially had. But if we can't, if, the, if Formula One, the teams or the fans can't get excited by Andretti Cadillac coming to Formula One, I don't think we've got a shot in hell of getting another T11 team coming to the grid anytime soon. Because I look at them and go, if it's not them, I don't see anyone else getting spectacularly excited by this. Um, but the way I see it is the teams actually don't have a lot of say in whether they want it, but they can definitely voice their contempt, which I feel like they're just more... No it, it comes back to actually with the conversation we we're having at the start of, what's the plan here? Can we get into the weeds of it? It's great that someone's had this idea, but how is this actually going to roll out? How is this actually going to work? How is this going to work for the teams who are already existing? Like, There's a lot of questions that haven't gone unanswered, or there's a lot of detail I think that's missing that I think some of the teams want. Let me ask you a more fundamental yeah. question, which I have a personal answer to, but I'll, I won't preempt yours. Okay. Do you, do you think Formula One uh, needs more seats in, in the sport? I do. I generally, I go back to the days of when, you know, what is it? The FIA apparently now caps it at um, 12 teams, 24, um, 24 drivers. But I remember back in the day where you had so many more entrants and actually qualifying was about who was going to qualify that could actually race on the Sunday, which I kind of think is exciting as well. Um, I do. I don't need. So I would much rather have more teams on the grid than more races. I find that the races dilute the championship. I find the races, the 24 races, absolutely exhausting as a fan, even more exhausting as a content creator. I Every time I talk to people in the paddock and the teams, it is brutal on them. It is brutal on their family. Like No one wants that. So truly for me, if you're going to try and grow the sport, the long, the better, more successful, in my opinion, long-term solution is 
grow the teams on the grid and that's going to take time versus just slapping on a new race after a new race and i don't think it would i, I think it's a no lose situation i don't think it would hurt formula one to have another team or potentially two on the grid with four you know two or four more drivers um i think it's it would be a great breath of fresh air and there are spectacular drivers out there in the world who i think you know could bring their skill sets um to Formula One. What I think we might have an issue is where it seemed to be, we seem to be lacking team principles for jobs. Um, so I don't know, that's going to be interesting if, as we add more teams as who's, you know, obviously for Andretti, it might be more obvious who the team principal is, but that's the funny thing. I don't think we're lacking drivers. I think we're lacking team principles to lead teams in Formula One. Well, well you've written- Finite resource. <laughs> yeah, well, you've written a blueprint for how to, you know, everything about Formula One. So maybe you should put your hat in the <laughs> ring, I don't know. <laughs> I'll just give my guide to anyone who's interested. I'll, I'll <laughs> knock on Andretti's door and say, I've got a little bit of a guide to Formula One. But to your point, the, the thing that was interesting was Andretti saying, and I think this is a this is the big thing that I will say is a, is a missed opportunity and a wrong decision to have a satellite office in Europe, but have the HQ in America and at its core, no matter how much it's growing and expanding globally, Formula One is this hodgepodge of cultural of european cultures coming together but the the beating heart and soul of formula one is in europe if not potentially between you know monaco italy and the uk and i think if you're not in that vicinity then i think you're missing out big time um and i think that's the mistake that andretti is making is thinking that they can be a part of this whilst being on the outside outside and just flying in and out and i don't think that's going to work is a fair point and like two points on that one like Michael Andretti appears maybe he hasn't learned from his sort of mm -hmm. pretty tricky 1993 season where mm -hmm. he decided to base himself in the US and fly in for the races uh yeah. but, but on a very lesson, arrogant yeah. In, <laughs> yeah. and don't get me wrong F1 has been very arrogant and thinking that they understood the American market and they thought they knew how to do it and every time they spoke I think with anyone with boots on the ground in America they'd be like no, that's actually not going to work. Um, but I think it's equally as arrogant as uh, from Andretti to think. And you're right. He, it sounds like he hasn't learned his lesson. Yeah, I mean, the other link is, uh, you know, in terms of geography, you were talking about Monaco and, and other places. I think you could probably draw a triangle between, yes. I don't know, uh, Oxford, Northampton and, or, and Milton Keynes. And you'd probably have most of the Formula One teams or at least Agreed. some of their factories in there. So. Yeah, there's, there's something about engineers living in that neck of the woods that, that helped produce good Formula One cars. Do you know the history of that, by the way? No, tell me. Um, so as briefly as I can, that area is called Motorsports Valley, and it's from post-World War II era, which I don't know if you know this, but like Formula One came out at a time where the war was ending and we had an excess of obviously plane, plane parts, airfields and aerospace um, engineers and they had nothing else to do. And so they thought, well, let's build fast cars and let's have fun and let's put our skills to use. And it was also at a time where there were no more cars in Europe and also in America post-World War II. And so again, like this, they, these parts all kind of came together and then they looked at all of these airfields that were abandoned, a hand, one of them being Silverstone. Um, and so that they took the cars that they were building and drove them around these airfields. And so that's why you end up with this um, motorsports valley where all of the teams are based. Um, it is from that history where it really started after post-World War II, where you had an excess of engineers, um, plane parts, no more cars, a lot of time, and it was a way to keep busy. Yeah, I do, I do know, and also looking at the layout of Silverstone, that it was a historic yeah. airfield um, and they've made it ever more complicated. Sort so of, to um, your point of just like this idea that we can keep sports out of politics, I'm like, mm, mm. I don't know about <laughs> that. It was actually built, um, you know, from from a, from a political aftermath. And there's so many other examples of that. But I those are that's one of my examples when people say we've got to keep Formula One out of politics. I'm like, I don't know. Um, I could I can draw a parallel all the way back and all the way to the start of, of Formula One. Um, that's very much embedded into into politics. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I won't delve too deep into politics on this show, but you're right that, it, that you can't split politics out from anything, really. No, that's the only thing people really need to know. That's yeah. that's the most succinct <laughs> answer. <laughs> You've there just you nailed go. I'll it. I'll bring the precision <laughs> to the conversation. Um, exactly. Let's break this up with a, a little short, uh, frivolous question. Um, and Tell to bring me. us to kind of a current crop of Formula One drivers and not in the lap of either Martin Brundle or 
Jos Verstappen. Yeah. Um, we play a game on this show called Taxi Dinner Avoid. Um, okay. And it's basically you've got to pick one driver to take you uh, to dinner. So who's driving you is the taxi driver. Okay, one driver who am I having dinner, dinner with. with? Yeah. yeah. And then one that you just completely avoid. Uh, you could be uh, sort of quite diplomatic, but uh, okay. the spicier, but, the better. So Okay, yeah, but currently on the grid today in 2023? Ooh, yeah, I mean, yes, but if you have a stonker of an answer that brings in another driver, I will allow it. So, yes. I don't know if I have a stonker of an answer from another driver. Um, I think I would love, this is a funny one, this might be British. I think I would like Kimmy, actually, to drive me, just because I like sitting in silence in, with my taxi drivers. <laughs> so I feel like Kimmy would just give me a blank stare and just be like, off we go, and that would be it. And I, th I just think that would be kind of funny. I'd miss a phenomenal conversation, but I, I, I think the idea of Kimmy as your taxi driver, um, I'll take Kimmy Raikkonen as my taxi driver, um, was the person driving me to the dinner. Um, I think the person I would most want to have dinner with Gosh, I either think it would be someone like Yuki Sonoda because he loves food so much and I feel like we'd have a blast. Um, or it, I think it would have to be someone like Lewis Hamilton, but I, because I would love, he's just got a story. He's got many stories um, and I love being, there's nothing, there's nothing more fun than being at a dinner next to someone and being able to enjoy good food and a drink and listen to someone about their life story and mm. what they're thinking about the future. So I think that would be, and who to avoid. I mean, I guess, you know, it must be interesting to be stuck at dinner next to Kimmy. Um, who would I avoid that's at the at dinner? Um, hmm. Honestly, guys, honestly, <laughs> I think the Ferrari drivers, because I feel, and this is my thing, I have, I'm, a, I'm biased against Ferrari, but this idea that Ferrari has of its Ferrari first, driver second, I feel like every time the Ferrari drivers come up to an event, they are sort of like ro Ferrari little Ferrari robots, and I just feel I wouldn't get anything out of it, and that's being harsh. Um, but I can't think of an, a, a better. I, I love people, so I can't think of anyone I'd try to avoid. But I think maybe if it was like an official dinner and I was sat next to a Ferrari driver, I'd be like, oh, you're wearing your Ferrari jacket and you probably don't want to talk about anything, and you're probably overthinking everything that you can and can't say but, but you might get to drink ferrari champagne you know or, or maybe Prosecco, that is know. true yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah that is no. um <laughs> well, i didn't know if they bought a vineyard in france i don't know <laughs> I, I actually don't actually you're spot on i actually don't know <laughs> yeah well, um, but those Prosecco. are my answers great question okay and you're sticking to them okay fantastic yes um the, my final word <laughs> The, the other big story on uh, F1 Twitter this week, uh, and we're recording this on the 11th of January, I think it was would have been Sunday, maybe Monday, was the announcement of a, a change in the, let's say, driver lineup, but at WTF1. Um, we were talking about media sources for F1. I, I yeah. don't tend to watch WTF1 that much. Maybe I'm not their target demographic. Who knows? Um, but is, it, is there content something you've come across or, or at least uh, engaged in before? Yes, um, I've come across their content. I think very similar to you. I am not their target demographic. Um, I am not the audience they had in mind. It is not my content um, that I, I don't think I've ever consumed. Apart from their goodbye video, I actually don't think I consumed any piece of content, um, except for maybe a few Twitch streams, but mostly joining for other people. But I will say this, Tommy undoubtedly... And I love this story, undoubtedly built something and saw a gap in the market 10 years ago and for I want to build something for the fans, by the fans. And I think super innovative what he built 10 years ago. Right? There's no, whether this is not my, you know, whether it's content I don't consume and I'm not a demographic, there's no one denying that he created something very, very special. He actually got my head swirling and thinking about what does it look like today if you've got a personality brand and you take away that personality is the brand strong enough to survive without that personality or do you need to do a full pivot of the brand and it becomes something completely different? And I think this is the challenge that they're going to have right now with Tom and Matt leaving. And I, I have, we don't know about Katie, but there's Katie there as well, which is also weird that the woman there is not mentioned. We don't know if she's staying. We don't know if she's leaving. It's all a bit weird. There's a great case study there, by the way, and how not to do a media handover. It's definitely that one. Um, 
but it is uh, it got my head spinning as we see more and more content creators emerge and some of them creating brands I think about this a lot it keeps me up at night with Sunday fangirls is do I want to build a brand that's bigger than me that if I ever leave the brand is still alive and thriving and kicking or am I the brand and when I decide to stop the brand dies with me um so and and it's funny that you tie it to the drivers because I was having this is a conversation I have all the time you know do you follow a team and then when the driver moves you stop following that team or supporting that team and you support the driver do you follow the drivers do you follow the team principles like what gets you excited which I also think F1 is so unique and complex in that area um so the, my my through line to all of this is they're going to lose people who were there definitely for Matt and Tommy and who've decided, nope, I'm here and I'll follow you wherever you go. If you start a new podcast, I'm going with you. There are people who are going to go, well, I was there for the WTF brand. Um, and I've heard there's a few people who believe that it was a brand more than, you know, Tom's, um, Tom's venture. And so they're excited. And then there are people who are fans of the court, the new cohort that's coming in of presenters, um, although it's been very unclear what they're doing. And if they're podcast presenters, Twitch streamers, we don't know yet. But they're coming in with their target audience. So very smart from the race media to be like, you know, what we're noticing is it's people first and content creators seem to be booming in this space. And they're building their own loyal audience. The one thing that I do feel bad for is the fans of WTF or Mac or Tommy of just like whatever happened and whatever went down I think a lot of the fans are caught off guard um, and I think they're going to have to rebuild some trust there with the fans but again just a fascinating example of media in 2023 and what it looks like I'm, I'm trying to think about another like other analogies because we talked about drivers and teams maybe it's more like the sugar babes I'm aging myself here they, see, they they tended, like, every year they would change one of their members. I don't know if you've heard of yeah. Sugar Babes. They're like a big UK band uh, yeah. from a long time ago. <laughs> it, is it is that. And I think it is... I, it, I, how were there, Was there, like, four or five of them in a group? I think there they were three. And then the, one of the originals left. I'm not saying I'm a Sugar Babes aficionado. But I think the way they got over it was they didn't have a number one in their original lineup, right? And then yeah. they got a couple of extra got new people in and then their music got better, quote unquote, better. It's yeah, subjective. Yeah. And I think I like that analogy in the what they're doing right now, bringing in this new cohort of, cohort of people is it feels like an esports team they've built. They've looked at it all like a K-pop band. They've looked at it and go, this person's going to have this character. This person's going to have this role and character. Great. They kind of work together. Let's figure it out. But there's no one one person leading the show, which is fundamentally different than the Matt, Tom and back in the day it was Jess and then they had Katie which was it was a trio of people but essentially it was Tom's idea and baby that he built Matt was the main anchor and so I think that is so I do think this is what I think WTF1 have missed here is an opportunity to rebrand going there was this thing that existed which was launched by Tom then we had Matt as some kind of a, I think co-founder but I might be talking nonsense because truly I don't know this 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 brand enough but what they have right now is much more like what you're explaining like a, a girls boys band uh esports dynamic a k-pop band which is you're all on the same level of playing field there's no one person you know first person here and we might pull in one person pull out one person replace you but that's a really hard pivot to do going from a brand that is personality led by one person and that's someone's baby to hey this is kind of the format we're going to uh, I, gonna, loved, yeah. I loved your tweets uh, about uh, putting certain names in your Twitter handle. Uh, oh, I cackled <laughs> at that one. And, and people got so angry. And this is fascinating because this is people got so angry at me saying that I said it, it, it had cultish vibes. And I think people forget that this is why I built the brand Sunday Fangirls as well. There's both cult, cult, cultish or fangirls essentially started out not being negative terms. It's just some men and the patriarchy and society decided this was a great way of humiliating women and humiliating people. So we're going to turn it into a very negative connotation with a ne very negative or very negative word with a very negative connotation. But you look around us, there's cults everywhere. Obviously, there's some very serious cults that we need to take very seriously. But, you know, I live in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, like all the startups with people wearing their lanyards and wearing their startup merch, like that's got cultish vibes. But more than anything, I'm worried from a legality perspective because someone like Tom and Matt, I'm just going to treat them like two co-founders. I get where you put the name of the company in your handle because you're a co-founder. But it's weird to me if you're part of a business or you're an employee, like if you join Tesco, you can put Tesco in your Twitter handle. But more worryingly is 
that means that that becomes the property and the ownership of your employer. Um, and there's great stories about BBC journalists went had a big BBC following, then went to ITV. BBC ended up owning her username. She had to start from scratch, which meant that who does it goes back to the question that we were having, like who does the audience belong to and who does the audience follow? It, it's a question that you know I guess will bear out on, on, on in the case of WTF one. Um, the internet hey, exactly. is a strange place. You know it better than me, but I feel like people will be watching it, and there will be a group of people, yes. a contingent that will think this isn't going to be as good. I can't wait for them to fail. Uh, and, I, and, and to counteract that, I hope they do well. So let's see. And there's going to be a group of people who think I never watched, and I might be one of those people, um, although I don't really follow the cohort. There's a couple of people I know, but there's definitely going to be a co cohort of people who go, I don't know what WTF1 is because they weren't watching Formula 1 10 years ago, but they are following the new, you know, some of the new people and go, yeah, I'm going to follow you. So I think there's, you, there's exactly that. When there's personalities, there's two sides to that, to that story, which becomes really interesting. But I think you're right, people are going to be watching from the sidelines. It's an interesting case study for sure. Talking about fantastic brands and definitely not cults, tell us a little <laughs> bit more, tell our listeners a little bit more about Sunday Fangirls and what it's all about. Um, and it's actually a funny tie to WTF1 because I actually got mad one day because I saw that they were selling t-shirts that said I'm not a fangirl or I'm not a fan, I'm not a fangirl, I'm I'm informed, or I keep forgetting what the name is. I was like, well, that's not great. Um, and I started out with my content being very factual, and there was a reason for that. I'd been through the ringer a couple of times. I know what it's like to be a woman on the internet. I know what it's like to be a woman with opinions on the internet. I also know what it's like being a woman in male-dominated spaces where I've you know, gone into meetings where it is my meeting, and I've invited people, and I'm leading it, and people ask, give me their coffee orders when they walk into the room um, because they see me and think, oh, PA, secretary, coffee go getter, definitely not the boss in charge that's running the meeting and the person who conveyed us. I'm lucky in that I have Tony, which can be a man's name as well. Um, so I know that feeling of being looked at and being judged and someone making an assumption based on what they have in front of them. And I know that that's why when I started pulling my beginner's guide apart and turning them into small TikTok videos that I was protecting myself a little bit and went out there with very factual information that people can argue with. Um, it was not opinionated. I always back everything in research, researches, uh, sorry, research and sources. And it was very, yes, I said, very factual. And then as I grew my audience and community and as I got a bit more comfortable, I started being more opinionated. And so that's when I started seeing what a lot of young women had already mentioned to me, which was the, the, the hate, the insult and of being a DTS fan. Um, being told to, you know, shut up and go to the kitchen. And I was like, oh, wow, this is alive and thriving on all social media platforms. And I had just finished a couple of books, one called Fangirl, one called, strangely enough, but great, but it's a great book called Word Slut, and actually also a book called Cultish. And it was all about the meaning of words and the history of words and linguistics. And, um, and this just got me thinking about, wait, fangirls are actually incredible human beings um fangirls have the finger on the pulse they understand whatever it is that they are supporting whether it's an actor whether it's a singer whether it's a band whether it's a formula one team whether it's a sports they put their money where their mouth is they hold the series and the teams accountable they know what's coming next um they rally the troops they create community they create space and why are we still disregarding them and disrespecting them and more and more i saw that the content that, that was being put out there was a lot of young women, clearly similar, similarly to Tom and his WTF one that he founded 10 years ago, filling in a void and creating content that they would want to digest, that they want to consume, that they were excited by and creating communities and creating safe spaces. And I had my own relationship with a fangirl that I know that it's a word that I never wanted to use, that I never wanted to be associated with. So this was my opportunity in my 30s to go, let's celebrate it. I want this to be a good word. So when people actually say, oh my God, another DTS fan, I just reply, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. I can't believe that you think I'm a DTS fan. I'm so excited. Thank you. Um, I Because I don't, it's, it's don't don't it's not an insult I keep keep trying to shove it as an insult on us and we're just gonna you know turn it back and so that's where that came out of, of this this idea I created a video called the ode to the Sunday fangirl which was hey the irony is all the drivers all the teams Formula One um 
the FIA and as well Liberty Media all are excited by all the women coming into the sport, but they're not celebrating them. They're barely acknowledging them. And the reality is you're all chasing the relevancy of these young women from the content that they create. You want them to buy your merch, but you're still not able to respect them. And so this is just my, hey, you need to be paying attention. You can't just want our money, want our relevancy, want the power of young women. You actually have to come with some kind of respect which is why I absolutely loved working with Aston Martin last year because mostly I worked with all women but they understood that through and through and they were there to celebrate all of their fans welcome all of their fans but truly shine a spotlight on all of the different fans that they had so that's kind of the genesis of Sunday Fan Girls. Fantastic and I'm looking at the merch looking at the merch store now and unfortunately all of your t-shirts they sold out I mean fortunately for you congrats but like um you know, that was on. I just Making merch is hard. And so I was just like, I don't have 10 grand to put up front because obviously it's also a fickle business. So they want you to buy everything up front. And so I thought, how can I do this that doesn't break the bank as it is as sustainable as possible, but also I can offer, because you can do ways where they go, okay, you can buy and it will be cheaper, but you can only offer S, M and L in terms of sizes. And I was like, no, it's important to me to be as inclusive as possible. So unfortunately, but that might change this year, I had to do like um, sporadic jobs where it goes live on a certain date, people have three weeks to go and buy everything. So it's not a marketing tactic to say it's sold out, to sort of entice you, um, but it was more of a very strategic play to me. of just like, I don't have, 10 20 thousand dollars to put towards t-shirts and caps um but that's a whole industry that i knew nothing about that i started discovering that is any so anyone who puts merchandise out there in the world you have you i salute you because it's not an easy it's hard but it was exciting to see how many people wanted wanted again it goes back to though you know wanting to be part of a community so it was exciting to see everyone wanting to to have a little piece of the sunday fangirl community which is very cool I'm excited for the future of that. It, it, it's incredible. And um, it, you strike me as the sort of person not to put you in a box, but that like explores and, and tries new things and absolutely nails it by the sounds. Thank of you. It. You know, so congratulations um, on your... And on I your don't, and, and important to say, I don't nail everything. There's a lot of things that I've done that I fall flat on my face or that just hasn't worked for me. And I think that's what I like about the internet when you're saying, like I, I joked on a, on a podcast the other day that I think this is where I live right now. I just live on the internet, which is a bit sad, but also great. I've met some incredible friends here, but you've got to try. It's There's a great opportunity now of just trying and seeing what works and what doesn't, um, which is fun. Well, look, we're coming towards the end. There are two questions I want to ask you. One slightly more serious, the other, okay. the question we ask all guests. The first one, give us, an, give us a sort of prediction for 2023 that you think our listeners will not find obvious. So have you got something you think is going to happen this year that perhaps will come out of left field? I did a bunch of predictions. It's a bit cheating that I'm starting to see is one of my predictions is we're going to start seeing more traditional media embrace content creators and bring them into the fold. And the WF1 example is a perfect example of that. But I think we're going to see this across the board in all traditional forms of media. They're going to start working with content creators to tap into that um, that Gen Z audience. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's a bit um, cheating yeah. because I was looking at it going, wow, on January 9th, my prediction for 2023 has kind of already happening. I'm going to need a new one because people are going to look at me and go, duh. And I'm like, yeah, but it wasn't duh on January 1st. Um, <laughs> but so that's a bit cheating. But that I genuinely think it's an exciting space. And I think there's a lot more changes that are going to happen. OK, well, um, let's see. 2023 seems like an upbeat year in the green, yeah. the virtual green room. Georgie was talking about how much she loves the year so far. So let's let's hope that vibe continues. Exactly. Let's keep the, it. The, qu the question of all, all our guests, Mario Andretti at the lot of them, right? Yeah. I'm going to assume something about you. I'm going to assume that you've had a pizza in your life and that yes. you might like pizza. Yeah. Yes. OK, okay this assumption. is straight. Yeah, good. There you go. Right. You've been pigeonholed <laughs> with 8 billion other people. Um, <laughs> well, yes or no question? Pineapple on pizza. I haven't ordered a pineapple pizza in, I think, almost two decades, but I definitely used to have them a lot. And I'm for the life of me now that I'm saying this. I don't want to blame my dad, but I kind of think my dad would order pineapple pizza with like ha well, pizzas with ham and pineapple. 
And I remember eating and going, oh, it's shit, it's not that bad, actually. So that's my answer. I've definitely had it. I've definitely enjoyed it. Have I ordered it in the last decade or two? No. Um, so I don't know where, I think I'm 50-50 on that. If it's on the table, I definitely think I'm taking a slice. Okay. I'll take that 50 for myself. <laughs> no, Georgie is a big pineapple fan. And I feel there like you you're chalking that up one for the good guys. I don't know. Let's see. Let's yeah, see. No, I've definitely had it. And I don't, I, but I, I think, Georgie, that's, it, if you like um, Thai food and Asian food, it, that the sweet and the sweetness that you can bring to a dish that pineapple is used so much in Thai food. And it always brings that like tart sweetness to something. And it's, it's good. So yeah, I'm, maybe I'm ordering a pineapple she pizza in the next, in the next day. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, we should buy some shares in, you know, pineapple plantations or something, you know, because we're doing a good service. Look, um, we're coming to a close. Uh, where where can people find you? And do shout out your uh, your podcast, another podcast. I was listening to the one about ships. Fantastic. Where can people find oh, you online? Um, thank you. Uh, you can find me on TikTok at F1 Tony until Formula One tells me that I can't use F1 in my name. But until then, it's F1 Tony. And you can find me everywhere else, whether that's Twitter, whether that's Twitch, whether that's Instagram or at Tony Karen Brown. So just my full name. Um, and yes, I, if you enter into technology, I have a podcast called Another Podcast with a Tech Analyst um, for the for the deep tech nerds. Um, there you go. Well, um, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Tony. It's been it's been fantastic. It's been fascinating. I can't I'm sure we can the hours just hour. flown by. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. No, this was we'll fun. have this to have phenomenal. you back sometime. Yeah, and thank and, you um, so so much. We look forward to seeing how your endeavors go. And when Andretti announced their new team <laughs> principal, uh, I will not be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled. Um, no, it's with all they first of all need to be accepted, but um, they've got a long they've got an uphill battle, which we're looking forward to watching from the sidelines for sure. Fantastic. All right. Well, Tony, thank you for having us, uh, for, for being with us. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, you do so go much. and check out uh, Sunday Fangirls, uh, another podcast, Unapologetic Women. So many All seasons, so, so storied, a veteran of the game, but still incredibly <laughs> young if you can do your maths of when uh, Jos Verstappen drove Bennett, uh, Benetton <laughs> Formula One car. Anyway, uh, I, I've been your unusual co host, F1 Blag. This has been another fantastic episode of Georgie Stripping and Dipping, and we'll see you next time. Good night.